My wife teaches fifth grade. My wife teaches fifth grade last school. Have your attention, please. Quiz is over. Let's stop talking. Okay. My wife teaches fifth grade, and she gave an, a, an exam last week, and she was saying that um, time was up on the exam, and she was trying to get a fifth graders to hand in the exam, and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't, and I said it's probably because they're 10 years old. But as you can see, you never outgrow this, right? The extra minute or two kind of, it really, I mean, it's, I, I, I think it, it often, the things you add in the last two minutes get you into more trouble than they're worth. So it's not gonna change. You're still going to take the extra minute or two. It's not, you know, so we let it go. A um, Couple of quick questions about, yes. <laughs> That's a very telling question. So I think that uh, it doesn't get removed. Somebody tell me what the actual rule is there. Let's make sure there is no confusion. What happens to your worst quiz? You get the average score you get on the other exams attached to your worst quiz. So in effect, it's replaced by what you did on the other quizzes, which means the effect is only is going to be as good as how well you do on the other stuff. So if you do badly in everything, it doesn't matter. I'm replacing a bad number with a bad number. It's still a bad number. So if this was your gimme quiz, you've got it out of the way. That's the good news. The bad news is it's out of the way now. You have no backup on the third quiz. You've got to do well. But no, that's, it, that's neither here nor there. Just on the quiz itself, on the first question, Pretty straightforward question, right? I gave you equity. And, and, I mean, like, what did I give you? What What was the first? What was I asking you in the question? Cost, cost of capital. capital, right? What are the four things you need for cost of capital? You need a cost of equity. You need an after-tax cost of debt, and you need weights for equity and weights for debt, right? I know this is this might be bringing up pain and open up some recent scars because you've just done the quiz, but I gave you the cost of equity. I thought about giving you a beta and a risk premium, but that's one more equation you could mess up on side. I'm going to give you the cost of equity. Did I give you the cost of debt? No. Well, but I gave you two numbers. What did I give you? A risk-free rate and a default spread. spread. So the cost of debt. What do we have to do to make it into a cost of debt you can use in the cost of capital? What do you need to multiply that number by? I think it's 5% if you add the two numbers up. One minus that. Already somebody's saying, oh my God, I forgot the one minus T. It happens all the time. Just let it go. It, you know, that's just, it's just you're in a hurry, you miss it, but you have to multiply by one minus the tax rate. It's just like a 25% tax rate. So you've got a cost of equity at 12%, an after tax cost rate at 3.75%. You need weights. And I gave you two numbers for both equity and debt. I gave you a market value for equity or the share price. And I also gave you a book equity. I gave you a book debt and I gave you interest expenses. So let's say I take the easier half of that. First, when you weight debt and equity in a cost of capital, should you use book value weights or market value weights? Market. Right. That's something every quiz we've kind of gone back on. I think I've, you know, in class we've gone back on the case you did this. So, so market value of equity is easy. Share price times number of shares. I didn't give you market value of debt or did I give you the ingredients you need? I gave you a book value of debt. What, what are the other two things I gave you about the debt? I gave you an interest expense 
and I also gave you a maturity for the debt. Now you could have ignored the interest expense and because you said there's no word, the, the market values never mentioned here, but if you have the book value of debt, you have interest expense, you have a maturity for the debt and you know your cost of debt to debt. Can you compute the market value of debt? We've did it for Disney. We, you know, presumably, if you're working on your case, you've done it to convert book value to market value. But I know that's that's asking for too much. You've had case, you know, you've had other stuff to do this week. But without even you know giving the equation, is there a way you can tell whether the market value should be lower than the book value or higher than the book value? What are the numbers I need to compare to make that judgment? Thank you. What's my interest expense? Twelve million, right? What's my book value of debt? Five hundred million. What's my book interest rate? 12 million divided by 500 is 2.4%. What's my market interest rate? It's 5%. Think like a bond, right? If your coupon rate is lower than the actual interest rate, then you're going to end up with the market value that is less than the book value. Now, how much less? You got to go through the mechanics. You got to take the present value, the interest expenses like a coupon, take the present value, the face value, I was checking through the quizzes as they were coming in. I think some of you, many of you tried to get market value. You were in the right direction, at least. Your market value was lower than the book value. But I think that I don't think very many of you have gone through the mechanics because the mechanics would have led you to a market value of about 400 million, roughly speaking. So if you got 320, you probably overcounted something. You got 470, you probably undercounted something. But that's math issue. So you are trying. I'm going to give you credit for trying. So I'll, you know, yep. It's how do you price a bond? You never, taxes never come into pricing a bond, right? You buy a bond. It's got nothing to do with the company, right? You're getting coupons, you get a face value. Yeah. It's a present value of the coupons discounted back at the cost of debt. Don't worry, it's a half a point. But the memories will last forever, right? <laughs> So the next time you see book value of debt, you're going to say, oh my God, I can convert to market value. And to me, that half a point is well worth the memory that'll leave behind. The second problem is tedious, right? Anytime you got to do three years of numbers, it's three columns. I, I know that's why I never ask a 10 year project. Just drawing the columns will take you up 30 minutes. But there are two things you got to mop up. One is, that there is this change in working capital that happens. The key word is change in working capital. And there's something you had to go through in the case, right? Take the change in revenues each year. So, and the fact that the change in working capital happens when? At the start of each year. Remember, when you work in time, the start of one year is the end of the previous year, right? Think of calendar years, right? The start of a year is January 1st. The end of the previous year is December 31st. So the start of a year and the end of the previous are the same, which effectively means a change in working capital, as in the case, should be one year ahead of. So the, the change you need in year one happens in year zero. Again, I'm, it's not, I'm not going to kill you if, you if you showed me years one, two, or three. In fact, I probably will not take points off for it. But I want you to think about timing, mattering, and cash flow. So that's a working capital effect. And at the end of year three, you got to tell me what happens. I know I left it unspecified, you're saying, well, do I need to salvage working capital? And I left it in your hands. And when you have to make an assumption, make the assumption that makes your life easiest. This is my general advice. So what's the uh, assumption that makes life easiest? Assume you will salvage the working capital for whatever the book value is. If you decide not to do that, I will go along for the ride, but you better go along for the ride with me because what do you have to do then if you assume, if you ignore working capital and you come back to me and say, you told us nothing about working capital, I chose to ignore it, I'll say, okay, but what's the loose end you have to tie up if you do that? You got to show me the tax savings you get from the fact that you're writing off, I don't know how many millions of working capital. I will give you full credit either way, but if you end in your three, you throw the working capital out and you say, I just ignored it. That's not complete because you've taken half the assumption, but not complete. So I'll start grading as soon as I can, which is right after this class is done. 
I will finish grading as soon as I can because I have two other quizzes coming at me this afternoon. So by the end of today, I'll have 750 quizzes. I don't even think about it. So it'll, it'll come, I'll have to do. So, but your quiz, it's first in, first out. So you'll get graded first, you'll get the, the message, you can come pick it up. So it's a sunk cost. I know we keep using that word, but it's, it's a very healthy word. In, uh, you know, not just in finance, but in life itself, is letting go. So just let go. I know it's easier for me to say because I did not do the quiz, but I do have to grade your quiz. Just let it go. It's done. And as um, uh, as was pointed out, this is, you know, just think of this as your freebie. Of course, if you took quiz one and that was your freebie, now you used up used up your freebie. This you have to think of the worst freebie. One of these is the worst freebie. Hopefully, this will not be the one. Okay, so today I'm going to mop up investment analysis. So let's go back and look at what we've come up to at this moment. We come up with cash flows, we come up with hurdle rates, and I think we decided that time-weighted incremental cash flows brings it checks all the boxes, NPV, IRR. And we make a decision based on looking at the NPV. Remind me again, what's the rule? The NPV is positive, you take the project. If the NPV is negative, you reject the project. Keep that rule, that's an absolute rule. But today I want to talk about some layers of uncertainty about that decision. Because when, you know, classifying a project as a good project or a bad project based on NPV is easy. But I want to talk about cases where you might override that rule and make a decision that looks like you're violating first principles. So I'm going to talk about three options that might be embedded in an investment that allow you to override the NPV and say, look, this is a bad project today, but I still am gonna hold on to it. The first, I'm gonna talk about the option to delay. What does that mean? You look at a project, it's a negative net present value project today, but you have the exclusive rights to this project for the next 10 years. So how would I get exclusive rights? You have a patent or a license. So here's my follow-up question. You have a project that has a negative net present value today, is it conceivable that the rights to this bad project could actually be worth a lot of money? You see the question I'm asking? Today, the NPV is negative. So you feel pretty sure that today, if you took this project, you would lose money. But you have the rights for the next 10 years. So I come to you and say, will you sell me the rights to the project? The question I'm asking is, will you just give it away for free? Because after all, it's a bad project. So I'm going to talk about the option to today. It's actually central to thinking about technologies that are non-viable that you might own, right? Right now, the technology is non-viable. The question I'm asking is, could the rights to a non-viable technology, maybe it's AI, maybe it's in the cloud, could those rights be worth a lot of money? That's your option to delay. The second is, let's say you're thinking about expanding into a big market. Let's take India, okay? You are a US consumer product company. You're thinking about investing in India. I do the capital budgeting project analysis for you. And they say it's a negative net present value investment. Don't invest. Is it possible you might invest anyway because taking this project gives you the right to a bigger project on the road? Maybe by entering in India in a non viable or a bad project today, you could get the option to expand. Sounds absurd that I would you'd pay for the rights to a bad project, which gives you a right to an even worse project. But this is actually the argument that people are using when they use the word strategic. What are you saying? I'm going to take a project that has a negative net present value. Otherwise, you'd never have to use the word strategic, right? The numbers alone would do it because it's going to give me rights to do other stuff in the future. So we're going to put some discipline into that. When is that option to expand right? Finally, when you invested in, uh, when Tesla was looking at the Tesla board, even those of you decide to accept. The big deal was you invested 20 billion up front, and then you had these cash flows where you were trusting that the market would grow and you'd get a 25% market share. Is it possible that two or three years into a very long-term project, you realize you've screwed up? That this project is never going to make you money. Would it be nice to be able to walk away from a bad project? In general, in life, is it nice to be able to walk away from your mistakes? It's the option to abandon. 
if you can walk away from a project, you might actually be more willing to take a long-term project than if you get locked into that project. All of these options, I'm gonna fit under the rubric of flexibility. Being able to change your mind can add value to investments. And I'm gonna show you what happened in 2020 to illustrate how flexible companies are able to come out of these crises in much better shape than in flexible companies. Think Airbnb versus Marriott. Think of COVID hitting and think of why Airbnb was able to skate through COVID with much less damage than Marriott was. It's a flexibility argument. So this is, I think, under the broader rubric of flexibility, it's these options we're talking about. So let's start with the first of these options, which is the option to delay. And for the moment, I'm just going to describe to you the option. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of actually valuing these options. I, in my valuation class, I actually value these options. I'm going to structure these options. If you're, you know, I want to ask you whether you remember option pricing models, because the truth is, you might remember the mechanics, but none of us ever remembers the option pricing model. Roger Hess times MD1 minus Q. Is, is, that's not, it's, it's unnatural to remember the option pricing model. But you remember what makes an option an option, right? So go back to foundations and think about what makes an option an option. What makes an option an option is the type of payoff diagram you have in an option. Let me explain. If you buy a call option, what's the most you can lose? What you paid for the option. You can never lose more than that because you can never be forced to exercise. You have the choice. It is a right not an obligation. So what does that mean? With a call option, you, the most you can lose Sorry, the slides are jumping around for some reason. For a call option, the most you can use is what you paid for the option. Let me bring that to play when I talk about the option to delay. Let's say you bought the exclusive rights to a project or a technology. The most you can lose is what you paid for it. Let's say this is a non-viable technology today. What does that mean? The net present value if you develop the technology today is negative. You bought the rights, you got the rights for the next 10 years, and the NPV today is negative. You think, why would I do that? Why do you buy rights? Companies do this all the time, right? They buy rights to technology that are not viable. What do they hope will happen? Something good, right? The market will get bigger. Maybe the technology's cost will change. And if that happens, what do you do? You develop the technology and you make money. So think of this as the, as the I'm gonna have to stay near here. My remote's not working properly. So, so think of that as what you will do if the project turns, if, if the, the net present value turns positive. Sometime in the next 10 years, two years from now, three years from now, if the project becomes a good project, you develop the project because the net present value is positive, you're still following the rule, and you feel good about having bought the rights to technology. Is it possible you could buy the rights to an exclusive technology and that it never becomes viable? Sure, right? In which case, what happens? You write off that original investment and say, I'm sorry I did it, but not really because if I buy 100 technologies like this, maybe 10 of them will pay off. I remember when Google, I think, bought Qualcomm's entire patent portfolio. And Qualcomm had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patents developed. It bought it with open eyes, knowing that many of these patents were not viable, but was buying a portfolio of options. When you buy a portfolio of options, you don't expect 80% of them to hit the ground and make money. You expect 10 or 20%. When you invest in options, especially out of the money options, which is what you're getting with non-viable technologies, what you're paying for is not what you will get today, but what you hope will happen in the future. And of course that hope could be unfounded. So here are the implications for investment analysis. Just because you have a project with a negative net present value, don't fall into the trap of assuming it's worth nothing and give it away. In fact, I'll tell you a story to illustrate the dangers of doing that. In the early 1970s, a company called RCA. You heard of RCA? It's a very old US company. In fact, 50 years ago, if you walked into somebody's house and you looked at their TV, it was an RCA TV, well-established TV company. 
making a lot of money in the early 70s, came up with the technology. And here's what the technology allowed them to do. It was actually a product. It was this big device where you put in a tape and the tape played a movie, the very first VCR. And they did a capital budgeting project analysis on that very first VCR. And they concluded that this product is going nowhere. What would people buy this product for? What were we going to watch? The demo tape that came with the, they said, this is going nowhere. And they were right. The NPV of developing this product in the late 60s, the early 70s, the technology hadn't developed. There were no blockbuster videos yet. You were getting ahead of the game. Your net present value was negative. So that part of the analysis they got right. And then they made what was their fatal mistake? They said, well, if this net present value is negative, we have the exclusive rights to it. That shouldn't be worth much either. And they sold it for a pittance. And I mean, when I say pittance, I'm talking about a tiny amount of money, like $50 million to a company called Panasonic. And the rest of they say is business history. Panasonic developed the original VHS, and as Sony came up with the beta version of it, and both products exploded because it turned out that you weren't watching demo tapes, that you could make movies into tapes, and you ended up with an entire business built around it. In hindsight, am I going to pick on RCA for selling the rights? No. That's okay, but what I'm going to pick on is the fact that they sold it for so little, because if somebody had looked at the technology and said, this is an incredibly uncertain market we're going into, what will happen is not known. We have the exclusive right. They'd have recognized that the value of the option here was significant enough that they shouldn't have given it away for nothing. So as you look at non-viable technologies or licenses that don't make money, is not, are not expected to make money. No. And if you finish the, the thought and think about how companies end up with exclusive how does a pharmaceutical company end up with exclusivity on its drug? What, what, I mean, what is the equivalent of that cost of buying an option that you get at most pharma companies? You think about what the cost of, the, of acquiring the patent is. Drug development. One is you could buy the patent from somebody else, but the other is you do internal R&D. One way to think about R&D is what pharmaceutical companies are spending on R&D is essentially the equivalent of the cost of acquiring options. And like any other option, you start a hundred different drug, you know, dr drug research experiments in your lab, maybe seven will pay off and three will be blockbuster drugs, but it changes your perspective on R&D. In fact, let me complete the process. What makes options unusual as an asset is it the only asset where as you increase the risk or the uncertainty, the value of the asset increases? That's strange, right? Because in most projects, when you increase risk, what happens? Discount rates go up, value goes down. So for an asset, higher risk often goes with lower value. With options, we turn that on its head. Why is that? What is it? Because what's the most you can lose in an option? What you paid for it. And when you think about risk, what's the risk that terrifies you? Not upside risk. Nobody lies awake and says, oh my God, there's a lot of upside risk here. It's downside risk that worries you and I've protected you against. So you know what that also means, right? If you think of R&D as the cost you're spending to acquire options, where should you direct R&D into diseases where there's a lot of things known and there's a lot of certainty or places where there's a lot of uncertainty? Gene therapy or coming up with a drug for diabetes where there's been a hundred research projects before. Diabetes. Your money is going to go away from projects where there's certainty to projects where there's uncertainty. Because the payoff, the value of the option is greater where there's more uncertainty. So if you look at where pharmaceutical companies spend money on R&D, you're going to see them spend in the areas where there's most uncertainty about what the future is, because that's where the optionality is great. It's holding all else constant. Of course, if you can make more money on diabetes, you're going to spend on it over, you know, what, over gene therapy. But if you have two projects of equivalent risk and the market size is the same, you're going to go with the product where you feel more uncertainty about the future. So any questions about the option to delay? Let's move on to the option to expand. This is, I think, the most dangerous of the options because as I describe it, you're going to see why it's so easy to get into trouble. So let me draw what the option looks like. The option to expand comes about because you took a project where you look at the project and you 
No, it's got a negative net revenue. So let's put that on the table. Your first project you're taking as a negative net revenue. You say, why would I take it? Because it gives you access to a very big market where if this first project works out better than expected, you will take a second project, which right now doesn't look viable. So you're saying this is going from bad to worse. I'm taking a bad project because it gives me the rights to an even worse project. But remember, the second project hasn't been taken yet. So let me again not start, uh, talk in abstractions. Let's suppose you're a hotel company, Marriott. You decide to open 10 hotels in China. Let's say this was your first foray into China, you're opening 10 hotels. Somebody does the net present value analysis and they say, you know what, the net present value here is negative because we don't know the Chinese market, the costs are going to be much higher. So your first reaction is let's not do it. But then I step in and say, but China is a really big market. There are a billion people there. That always tips the scale. And if these 10 hotels do better than expected, we can open a hundred more hotels in China and think of how much money this would make us. Now, do you see why I call this the strategic? Because that's a strategic argument, right? This investment has a negative net present value, but if things work out, it could give, you, give me this right to so this really lucrative second investment that I could do. <clears throat> so the net present value comes from the fact that right now you're taking a bad project, but if that second investment pays off, the first project work does better than expected, then it gives you the rights to a second project. And that second project is enough net present value to cover the negative net present value of the first project. It's that second project that is the option. And that option can tip the scales. Now, now do you see why companies were so eager to get, I, I'm convinced the first 10 or 15 or 20 years, in fact, this is probably still true, companies that invested or expanded to China did not make money. They knew they were entering money losing investment, but they justified it by saying, but this is a big market. And you can see this argument play out in any big market, right? Companies get into big markets knowing they will lose money. Now, banks get into fintech. Why? Big market. I know we're going to lose money, but we're going to do it anyway. I'll wager that right now across the world, companies are looking at AI, saying, this is a big market. Let's spend 100 million. We know we're not going to make money on this, but if it works out, so I'm going to give you the word that you should use to kind of counter those people who push this big market argument to keep entering big markets, even though you will lose money. Let me go back to the Marriott example, and, and I want you to think about this word. The word is exclusivity. What does that mean? If you and only you have the rights to the second project, then the option to expand is real and valuable. But if anybody can do it, you've got to be really careful about spending money on a bad project because it gives you the rights to an even better project. We go back to the Marriott example. What is my argument? Open these 10 hotels. And if they do really well, it's going to give you the, right, uh, the capacity to open 100 more hotels. So you open the 10 hotels. They do much better than expected. Your capacity is at 93% instead of the 60% you thought. You're making a ton of money. You're learning a lot about the Chinese market, right? But are you the only one learning? I'll wager Hilton is probably sending guests to your hotel to see how they're doing, just as like spies. Just tell us, is a, is a hotel full? Is a lot of people coming in? So while you're collecting information, Hilton is collecting the information, the Chinese hotel company is collecting the information. And just as you get ready to open the 100 hotels, this is the icing on the cake, right? This is what's going to make a net present value positive. What happens? Hilton opens 100 hotels. What they've done is they've used your market research to essentially go out and make the decision. So what would have to be true about that first scenario that allowed you to open the 10 hotels? What would you have to be fairly sure about? Some kind of exclusive license. So the Chinese government says, if you open these 10 hotels in this undeveloped part of China, we will give you the exclusive right to open 100 more hotels here. Then there's an option to expand. So when you look at 100 times that people make the argument about AI, about fintech, about China, big market to justify an investment. If you're on the other side of the table, the question you've got to ask is, what makes us special? What makes us unique? If you're doing what everybody else is doing or anybody else can do, I guarantee you that looking back, you're going to regret and say, 
why do we do that? And I've seen this happen with bank and banking and how much money they've invested in fintech in the last 20 years. It's a big business. Let's invest in it. Everybody's doing it. There's no exclusivity. You're almost, you know, the end result is almost pre-written that you're going to look back with regret and say, if everybody can do it, then nobody gets a special deal. So you're going to take a bad investment. You're going to justify it with the big market. Show me some evidence that there is exclusivity and I'm willing to listen. But if there isn't, you got to let go. And I think I skipped the option to abandon. The option to abandon. As I said, the option to abandon is a very useful one because you walk away from your mistakes without digging the hole deep. So why don't companies always do that with long-term projects? So you're three years into a project. You know this project will never pay off. Why did they? First is, remember what you talked about, sunk costs? The Yankees should have cut A-Rod after year five. Everybody knew it. Take the money, say, this is a lost cause. You don't want a guy waving his bat at that, you know, that, that, that fastball outside the strike zone. It's one out you're giving away. But Brian Cashman would never have done it. For the same reason, Aaron Hicks is going to be the outcome. You have no idea who I'm talking about. Just let it go. Right? That Aaron Hicks is going to come out of the outfield every other day or every day, God help us, for 162 games. One is sunk costs. You think. The second is sometimes you can't get out of that investment. Why? Because you've locked in contracts on both. The, because you're told this is a good thing, right? Go lock in contracts. You made yourself inflexible. And guess what? Once you've done that, you can't back away. So if you can walk away from investments, you have an option. But this is the only option. These are called real options. You hear the word real option. This is what people are talking about. It's the only real option that's a put option. Because you're walking away. You're selling whatever you invested. You make back maybe a half of your original investment. But that's your option to back. The option to delay. The option to expand. The option to abandon. And they all fall into this broader area that I call flexibility. You know, we all talk about companies need to be flexible. When I hear flexible, I'm thinking about optionality. How much optionality? you Because this is something you can start to do as a company to make yourself more flexible. By doing what? How can Tesla, in the Tesla bot example, create more flexibility? What are some of the things they could do? But even without the outsourcing, what's my big problem here? You invest 20 billion upfront into a big factory. Why? Because you get economies of scale. What if you did this as three, five billion dollar investments over time? You might have to pay in terms of efficiency, but what do you get? You get optionality. You get the optionality to decide whether to expand based on what you observe in the marketplace. Talked about outsourcing. You take fixed costs, you move them to variable costs, you're making yourself more flexible. So sometimes companies take the karmic view. We have a lot of fixed costs. There's nothing we can do. We're inflexible. But you can actually work on your business model to make it more flexible. And the payoff then is that you're getting options embedded in your company. You're able to walk away from your mistakes. You're able to build on your successes. And you can hold on to your exclusive rights and you create the values. So when I hear the word flexibility, I'm thinking about all those different options. So it's true in some businesses, you have less flexibility than others. Now, take the classic example in the hospitality, you get Airbnb, incredibly flexible business model, right? Why? Because they don't own the apartments. They can scale down and scale up almost effortless. But if you're a traditional hotel company, how does scaling down even work? Because you've got these physical hotels that you can, cannot walk away from. So you can already see that across businesses, flexibility can vary. So at the height of COVID in 2020, I wrote a series of 14 posts. Every two weeks, I would write a post about what I'd learned over the previous two weeks, because this was something that the, world, the global economy had never gone through, right? A complete shutdown of the global economy in March and April of 2020. Markets were thrown off, economies were thrown off, sectors were thrown off, companies were thrown off. So what I did was I classified companies based on flexibility. So what did you use as a metric for flexibility? I used a very simplistic metric. 
did something that I use in my valuation class where I look at how much revenue you get per dollar of invested capital, arguing that if you're a company that gets a lot of you know, lot of revenues per dollar of invested capital, you're more flexible than one that's kind of tied in a lot of invested capital. I broke companies down to decimals, and you can make your own judgment. This was between at the peak of COVID, that first six months of 2020. Take a look at the last column, and you're going to see how much the market cap changed. And you can already see companies that are less flexible were hurt a lot more than companies who were more flexible. Intuitively, it makes sense, but the market clearly also brought that to bear. Does that mean that you should always go for flexibility? It's a trade-off. By being more flexible, you give up something, right? There's always a trade-off, but you have to look at that trade-off and see, is there something we, I can do to build in flexibility? About 15 years ago, I had to give a talk. I usually don't come to the graduate ceremony where you get your MBAs because I'm usually on my way somewhere, or grading usually. So about 15 years ago, I had to come to the ceremony because I had to give a talk. I don't know how I ended up getting picked for this dubious honor. So I showed up and I had not prepared. And I talked about options. <laughs> you know what I talked about? I said, life is full of options. I mean, take personal relationships. What's your option to delay? You're going out with somebody who's been going out for 10 years. I know somebody who was, when are you getting the option to delay? Basically, that one side of the relationship, you said, no, it's, you know, once you get married, it's, it's locked in. So let's use the option to delay. And once you get married, how does the option to expand play out? No, that's the option to abandon. That comes after the option to expand. The option to expand says, why do I have one spouse? Why don't I have three spouses? So you, you have affairs on the side. That's your option to expand. People take it. And then, of course, once that comes to the surface, you have the option to abandon. But I want you to think about these options when you make the decision about which job to take. Hopefully, you'll have multiple jobs to pick between. And if you pick basically you know, on which one has the highest salary, no, just take the total amount, salary plus bonus. You're going to come up with one decision, but I want you to factor in the optionality you get with each of the jobs. The option to delay making a final commitment about where you're going to end up working. An option to expand. Which of these jobs gives me a chance to do other stuff? And finally, and most important, preserve your option to abandon. Most of you have lost it already. I give the, I used to give the undergraduate uh, the, the analyst training programs at the investment banks. And I taught a very subversive version of a class to them because they were investment banks. They were, I was supposed to come in and train them on becoming Excel ninjas and listen to your managing director, which is exactly the opposite of what I think about the world. So I told them all the things they should question their managing director on mm -hmm. and how to make a pest of themselves at group meetings about questions to bring up. <laughs> And then I said, in doing all of this, preserve your option to abandon. So what? Preserve the option to get up from your chair, throw the annual report that your managing director just gave you and said, I want this on my desk tomorrow morning in his face and say, do it yourself. It's a deeply satisfying moment when you throw that. But then there are deeply dissatisfying moments that follow. Preserve your option to abandon because it'll make you a better banker, a better employee, because if you know you can walk away, you can speak your mind. People often wonder, how do banks get into the scandals that they do? How do they make these mistakes where everybody should be saying, this doesn't make sense? Why doesn't somebody speak up? Because you're afraid to speak up. Why? Because you sp spoke up. You might be shunned initially and fired later, so you hold your tongue. Wouldn't it be great if at least one or two people said, I don't care if I get fired. This makes no sense. I mean, the SVB, did you see the story that, that their risk model was flashing red? So what did they do? They changed the assumptions on the model to make it flash green. How convenient. But before you laugh, this happens. This is the rule rather than the exception. If you don't think this happens in capital budgeting, in project analysis, in risk management, you're being naive. And I think part of the reason it happens is because we've lost the option to abandon. So let me close off with one final point. You take a project, you have existing projects, and you're two or three years into the project. 
and the actual numbers come in. Remember you had forecasted numbers? First, let's put, uh, put a question on the table. Will the actual numbers match your forecasted numbers? So what percentage of the time will the actual numbers match your forecasted numbers? Zero percent of the time, right? Not because you're, so there are two things you do when you look at this, these existing projects. One is you feel this urge to hold people accountable, post-mortem, and that's good, right? You want to be, you hold people accountable. So we'll talk about what you learned from that. The second is remember, you now face choices on this existing project. Like what? You might be able to abandon the project. You might be able to expand the project. You might be able to continue the project. You might be able to divest the project. So let's take the first part, which is that post-mortem part. And let's see what you learn. So let's say you have an existing investment. You originally took it. And what do you see as F0, F1 were your original forecast? But you're two, one year into the project, so A1 has come in. The actual numbers have come in, and you're learning something, right? Either you overestimated numbers or underestimated numbers, and you're now going to make new forecasts for the next nine years. I want you to start thinking about, you know, will those numbers be higher or lower based on your learning? So it's a conditional forecast, you know, after year one. And as I said, that actual number is going to be different from your expected number, and I'm going to list two reasons and maybe even a third one why the numbers are going to be different. The first is you're not God. Things happen, you didn't expect them. It's pure chance, right? You can't forecast every eventuality. You decide to build a hotel in December 2019 based on really good forecasts. What threw you off? A dumb thing called COVID that came in that shut your hotels down. And if I fired you saying, how come you did not predict COVID? That would be extraordinarily unfair. So first is chance. <clears throat> The second is bias. Bias is when you overestimated the cash flows because you wanted to take this project. So I'm going to ask you a generic question. If you're going to have a choice, so you have 100 analysts working for you, and you have a choice between analysts making mistakes and analysts being biased, which one would you rather have? And what's the thing about mistakes that is better than makes than bias? You learn mistakes average out right you take a hundred projects you make mistakes remember mistakes cut in both directions and some projects you're going to underestimate numbers some projects you're going to overestimate numbers mistakes average out bias never averages out because by definition you're overestimating the cash flow for every project i give you i'm going to take far too many bad projects and you want to create if you're a company a process that doesn't punish mistakes but does punish bias. How would I know? Let's say I look at the 100 past projects you've taken in the last 10 years. If it's mistakes you've made, what should I expect to see on these projects? In about half the projects, the number should come in above expectations. In half the projects, the number should come in below expectations. If I look at the 100 last projects or the 100 last valuations you've done, in 97 of those, your cash flows came in higher than expected. Don't even talk to me about mistakes. This is bias. So given a choice between mistakes and bias, you want to make sure that you don't punish people for making mistakes. What are you going to do if you do that? You're going to make them risk averse and even good projects are going to get rejected. Because if you reject something, you cannot make a mistake, right? Because how do you know that? Because in hindsight, you might say, that was a project I should have taken. Nobody gets fired. Or very few people get fired for rejecting projects they should have taken, but lots of people get fired for accepting projects that end up as bad projects. So you're gonna make people risk of us. So final point here, when you look at an existing project and you turn to what should we do in the future, you basically face four choices. Maybe you can shut the project down. What will I get with li liquidate the project? Okay. <laughs> Maybe you can sell the project to somebody else. Maybe you can continue the project, even though, the, remember, the cash flows are less than expectations. You could still be making money in the project. Or maybe you can expand. You're saying, why would I expand the project? Maybe there's something you can invest in the project that makes it a good project. So I'm going to end with an example, and you can look at the actual numbers. How many of you have been to Disneyland in Anaheim? Okay. Disneyland in Anaheim has two parks. It used to be just one park. There was a Disneyland park, the original Disneyland park. And then you had a parking lot, a huge parking lot on the other side. And about 20 years ago, 
Disney bought, built the second part called, park called California Adventure. And when they built the park, they built it on the presumption that 60% of the people who go into Disneyland would go across together because the two parks are across from each other. It's easy, you can just walk across. They assume 60% would go. Why only 60%? California Adventure was designed to be a more grown up park, you know, it had roller coasters and things that relate to California. They said lots of people who bring small kids might not come across, but at least 60% would. And they expected the cash flows to be about $100 million a year. In actuality, 10 years later, when they look back at the numbers, only 40% were coming across. They were making only 50 million in cash flows instead of 100 million. And if you looked at what they invested, a billion and a half for the project, in hindsight, it looked like a bad investment. So they had four choices. The first is they could shut the park down, maybe get a third of the book value back, no, half a billion, and convert it back into parking lots. So if you do that, you get a half a billion. The second is they can continue the park with the lower cash flows. Remember, you still get 50 million a year in perpetuity. That present value works out about 600 million. So you can say that, or I'm sorry, it works out 1.1 billion. So that's the second deal. Just let continue. In hindsight, the 1.1 billion is less than the billion and a half we invested, but we can't get the billion and a half back anyway. Let's continue. And then a third choice, which was they invested another 600 million into the park. They could, you know, maybe with more kid friendly attractions, cars or a Toy Story, that they could get more people coming across. And that would increase the cash flows back from 50 million to 80 million. You have three choices. First choice, liquidate, you make a half a billion. Second choice, continue, make 1.1 billion. You already are going to continue rather than shut it down. But then between continuing and continuing with expansion, the way you assess the extra 600 million, say, what does it bring? And it brought in about 60 million additional, a net present value of 60 million, which is what they ended up doing. They invested extra money into a park that wasn't living up to expectations. And they're still doing it, hoping to get the numbers up. But that's basically the way to think about existing projects is the game's not over. It's continuing. And you still have to make decisions on what to do with those projects just to make, make the ones that add the most value to you as a company. Okay, so that's about it. And I will see you on Wednesday. Okay, please, uh, please print off packet two for Wednesday because we will start on the second packet.